And we are live. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome to Oz Property Investors with Prue Muirhead and Scotty Agate. We are in for a treat today. How are you, Prue? Excellent. Thanks, Joe. How are you? I'm fantastic. Have you had a good no, day so far? Very good. Thank you. Always a good day. Yep. Oh, and Scotty Agate, you've, you've changed scenery here. We're excited to have you co-host. I have, I have. I'm moving around. You guys are following me. It's kind of a bit weird, like almost stalkerish, but I'm good, <laughs> mate. I'm very good. And I'm grateful to be hosting tonight. Does that mean that I've got Jeff's seat permanently if I do a good job? Yeah, well, I've been trying to get rid of him for years. Um, so yeah, any any excuse will do. So <laughs> <laughs> no, Jeff is Jeff is fantastic. So Thanks for uh, thanks for tagging in though. This is going to be an awesome session. Um, so let's let's kick it off straight away with um, with our quotes of the week. Um, and Scott, you've actually said you're going to not do as a quote at all. It's you fully rejected the the notion of a quote. What are you going to give us instead? Well, just because I've done quotes on the show before when I've done my recording, so I'm going to go with an investment philosophy that I heard yesterday, which I think was gold. And it was from someone that Joe and I follow and listen to their podcast, which is Sean Puri on My First Million. Oh. And he was talking about mistakes he made um, in his 20s, looking back at it as a man that's in his 30s now and has gone on to have great business success. And he said, rather than um, look to investing in all these shiny objects and try and solve all these problems, what they should have invested in was everything on their P&L, all these companies that they'd studied and built their tech stack around all these businesses they want to integrate into their own service while they're transacting day to day in their tech business all went on to be huge business successes whilst many of the things they were chasing around it were failures so it was a whole look really at what's going on around your world and potentially what you're already dealing in or what's working for you in life is potentially a great place to invest in so i like that little bit of philosophy from um sean puri drum Oh, bomb dropper. I was going to say drum bopper, but that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> that's you in the club. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's a good little philosophy. I like that. Uh, I think, it, I guess that's get a better audience, right? Get a better, get a better amount of people around you um, so you can have those type of opportunities presented to yourself. Um, yeah, right under your nose, some of these things. Yeah. Prue, what is your quote of the week? Joe, mine's more of a statement, and I guess it's associated a little bit because I'm a property manager. It's allow yeah. pets in your rental home because it costs you nothing, but you do get extra returns. Perfect. Okay. A little controversial because, I, you know, initially you think, oh, don't have pets because they're going to tear the place up. Yeah. Yeah. But They don't do, like, we really have trouble with pets in houses at all. And, I mean, you've got a bond anyway, and generally speaking, um, it seventy percent of the market have pets, so wow. you're closing That's off your market if you do not allow pets. And prove so nationally at the moment. Nationally at the moment, is there a, um, a standard kind of law in the rental world that <laughs> says that it's difficult to withhold or it's impossible to withhold permission for? You know, no, for every a single dog or a cat, they've got to get permission for it every single time. Yeah, oh, strata's different. Obviously, when you've got a unit, it's a little bit different. You've got to abide by strata. But as a rule, um, if you own a house or even if you own the whole block of units, and many units do allow pets um, in South Australia, because I'm based in South Australia, and each of these residential tenancies are state based. So there is a lot of variation from one state to another. But I know there's some states where they get a pet bond, so you get extra bond. Um, so you obviously send that money off to CBS or, you know, the government. Um, the other side is with us, we just have like a pet lease, so to speak. It's just a, a simple sheet that they say they'll keep the pet outside. And we all know that, you know. Hmm. As soon as it starts to <laughs> rain. But, you know, we're, we're, Fluff, you know, we're, all, we're all educated people. We know that that's not always the case. But at the end of the day, 70% of the market have pets. You've got to remember that because, I mean, I've got a pet. I don't know whether I'm too scared to ask you both of you guys got pets. <laughs> I'm, not got pet? no, I'm not I'm not a pet. <laughs> oh, no. Joe, I'm not answering that question. And Joe, don't answer that question on my behalf. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so Scott does. So yeah. So you can sort of understand it's all about appealing to the bigger market you possibly can to get the best rental returns and the best tenants. So that's ultimately so let pets in your houses, yes. Yeah, and it's actually a really good theme as well because a lot of people 
buy property, like what a lot of the people that I deal with buy property based on their own proceed, like preconceived notions. And it's the yeah. same with renting. You know, I don't have a pet, so I think pets destroy everything. But yeah. in actual reality, growing up with pets, we had pets in the house. It was absolutely fine. So um, you just got to kind of remove your own preconceived notions from what you think pets are going to do and actually yeah. look at the data. 70% of the audience have pets and they want it. Maybe it's worthwhile. And they're yeah, more stable too because it's harder to get these houses too. So once you get them, they stabilise mm. as well. Nice. Great. I was going to say 100% of kids a problem if 70% of the are in the houses. 100% of kids make a mess as well. <laughs> exactly. My, my two, I'm 100% from on my strike rate anyway at home. Yeah. <laughs> well, my, uh, my quote's not as educational as yours, uh, both of yours. Mine is, it's more important to do the big things well than the small things perfectly. Um, I like that little one because I'm definitely – of the opposite i don't do the small things perfectly but i do try and do the big things well but i see a lot of people get bogged down into the detail of things that don't necessarily matter too much like totally. you know like oh i don't like the color of the carpet um so i'm not going to choose this investment i don't i don't like you know uh, like don't like the fact that it can't be uh, subdivided. That's a that's something to be worried about. But don't be worried about the color of the walls that can be painted or the carpet that can be changed. Um, so do the big things well. Um, so before we introduce you, Prue, we always do a little uh, a little ad for some of our amazing sponsors. And usually Jeff helps me out with this, so it might be a different. So <laughs> let's run that ad and see what happens um so i'm going to make me big just oh, fyi i'm not paying this week if you don't run my ad <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> this live session is sponsored by scott agate from hello house scott has created the world's first property negotiation as a service business so what does that mean well, let's think about it. When was the last time you negotiated on anything over $100, let alone a property that is going to be one of the biggest investments of your life? The vendor, they have a trained negotiator on their side in the form of a real estate agent. That's kind of like you stepping into the ring with Mike Tyson after never training a day of boxing in your life. These guys are trained professionals and that's what they do day in and day out. And this is what Halley House does every single day as well. They negotiate on property to get the best buy price from the real estate agents. Scott Agate, he's the expert negotiator. He has been in this industry since 1995. He owned and operated three Bell franchises. Scott was the guy that was teaching these real estate agents all these agent games. He knows all of their tricks. Having him on your side is going to give you a massive unfair advantage and literally save you tens of thousands of dollars. Unlike other ways of purchasing property, Scott's incentives are aligned with you, the buyer, meaning the more money he saves you, the more money he makes, which is what you want. You need to have those incentives aligned. Scott has kindly offered our group a massive discount on the retainer fee for his service. So if you're looking to buy your next home or investment property, click the link below to get in touch. There we go. Get in touch with Mr. Scotty Agate. That went smoother than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so super excited to introduce the uh, wonderful Prue Muirhead. So for those that don't know who this wonderful lady is, um, Prue, you've spent... 15 years lecturing uh, at TAFE South Australia, is that right, on property investing? Yeah, well, I um, yes, absolutely. Well, I met Peter Kalisos after winning Investor of the Year and he took me under his wing and obviously he needed some people to teach a couple of subjects. So I took on renovating for investment and finding a good property manager what to look out for and managing your own home actually is what he used to do. So that's wow. been, it's been great. I love it. I love watching people make money. Yeah, well, you won property property investor of the year. Um, you also yeah. now run your own property management, which is in the background there. You had property management with your yeah. uh, husband, who's a builder, and your your son, who is um, who is a part of the business as well. So yeah. I, I wanted to get you on. You have seventeen cash flow positive properties, and um, you've had a bit of uh, turmoil and difficulties going through that whole process and purchasing and getting to that stage. And um, one thing that I've realized with you is you just don't quit. So I would love to, <laughs> you just don't give up. And 
that's what I'm kind of hearing a lot of sentiment out there in the market, like, oh, interest rates are going to go up. There's the the bank is struggling with the lending. It's becoming difficult. Blah. The same things that everyone is hearing, but you kind of look at it in a different light. So just to kick this thing off, actually, before we kick it off, it would be good for everyone. We're going to have, I've got two people in here that have been in the property industry for many, many years. Um, so there's going to be a lot of golden nuggets. So if there's a golden nugget in here, pop it in the comments, what your golden nugget is. If you can get one helpful tip away from today, it's going to be worthwhile your time. Um, so let us know when that come, comes about. Um, but Prue, yeah, tell us, give us a bit of an insight about how did you get into property investment? Well, I guess the bottom line is, is my strategy has always been um, how can I rather mm. than can I, if that makes sense. A lot of people sort of start on the opposite side of the glass half full, but I I didn't set out to win. I was really honestly worried about our future. So I was a disc jockey for 15 mm. years and um, we were combined. Andy joined me, my husband joined me, and we had two young kids, and we were on a minimum wage. In fact, we combined were on a minimum wage, so we're earning half of a minimum wage, if that makes sense. And, wow. you know, with a couple of young kids and a mortgage, it, we had no super. I was really honestly worried. And I knew that um, I had real estate parents, and I knew that ultimately property was an avenue that you'd be able to borrow money and you could build wealth. So I went to, we owned, we didn't own a principal place of residence. We we're obviously paying it off like everyone else that's young and with young kids. And so I went to the bank thinking, oh, I might buy a first investment property. And sadly, because I gave them so much information about our finances, which had changed since we'd bought the house, um, suddenly found ourselves with only 30 days to work out what to do because they said, you can't even afford your own home. So oh, wow. I, I remember that being yeah. such an awkward time. So we had 30 days to work out what we we're going to do. Were we going to sell a house? Were we going to rent a house out and live somewhere else? So we looked at, I knew that I didn't want to let go of our own home. In fact, we, I'm sitting in it still now. And so <laughs> it's still that same house from back then and um, means a huge amount to us. So then I just sort of decided that, okay, well, that's my property. So I heard magically, you know how life works sometimes and you get every, everything just works to your advantage. And there was a ad on the radio that said, if you're having trouble getting money, ring us. So, <laughs> well, I was having trouble getting money. So I rang them. Perfect and people that, to call. They are, they are. And and it was um, Resi Home Loans. I don't know if I'm supposed to mention that, but I don't even know if they're still around. But they were offering low dot loans, which are still around today, but ultimately it meant self-verification. I could sign one piece of A4 paper saying that we earned a lot more than what we did. So I signed that piece of paper <laughs> with Andy. I don't think you meant to say that bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Beyond seven uh, years, they can't go back. <laughs> no, true, true, true. And uh, so ultimately they gave us a, a line of credit against our house with a different lender, obviously, had to move away from the big four that knew too much about us. And so we were able to pay off our mortgage with itself, if that makes sense. And um, so we sort of got our feet on the ground for about four years and bought our first investment property four years later in 2006. Um, and it was one around the corner, you know, all those things that you look for when you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and after that time, uh, using equity in our own principal place of residence, we used a deposit. And then around that time, I got given a friend of mine, Adam, gave me a book from Robert Kiyosaki. He'd never had anything to do. He said, you might like this book. And I'm sure you guys have heard of him. I read yeah. that book. And then I started to educate myself. I ran into a book from Margaret Lomaz and Steve McKnight. And they were talking about this thing called positive geared property. Because mm. it made sense to me, we couldn't carry negative geared property. Even that first one we bought was slightly negative and that might have cost us, say, $40 a week. And that to me was just tying us to a job. And we didn't have $40 a week. We didn't have 2,000 spare dollars. Mm. So I um, heard about these, you know, these positive geared properties. Everyone was talking negative back then. Yeah. And um, so I thought, all right, I reckon I could do that. I reckon I could do that. And then another book I read in this same period of time was Buy One House a Year for 10 years and okay. then wait for the equity using equity from previous properties to end up um, with your 10 properties and then continue working until you're ready to retire and then sell off however many properties you need to pay off the debt of the lot and live off. So sell four and keep six and live off the rent of six freehold yeah. properties. So that, that was what it set out to do. So that was the goal. And 
that was the goal. So this is 2006. So we bought the first investment property. So in 2009, uh, well, actually February 2010, they um, announced me property investor of the year because on no income virtually, we bought 14 properties wow. and they were all wow. cash flow positive. So I know to go, it was like, it was a very it was a crazy four years, but we got to 14 properties or um, so it's been an interesting ride. But then. So once- what, what, what is property investor of the year for those, for those that don't know, what, you know, what does it actually mean? How does it? How yeah. does it work? Well, it's not something you can win twice because <laughs> your story is only new once. But it's, um, it's, it's, and how big is the trophy? That's all I care about. Yeah, yeah well, like, that's you know, pretty or... cool stuff. I got some yeah. pretty cool stuff, but it was part of the Your Investment Property magazine, um, which I was reading, and I know I made lots of money and because I educated myself reading those. I used to get it sent to me every month and I'd read it from front to back just to try and educate myself. And and then there was, you know, they they sort of call for people that have got a good story to enter this property investor of the year. And um, Andy, my husband's such a massive support. He's so beautiful. And he kept putting this magazine in front of me and saying, enter this Pruy, enter this Pruy. You know, <laughs> I think, you know, have a go, have a go. And so I did, but I never, ever expected it to win. But because of that, it sort of launched me into teaching with Peter Kalisos, which is I just adore that man. He's a good friend of mine now. Yeah. Um, and just and then I went, ended up winning a Property Woman of the Year award. So they were flying me around to each state so I could guest speak around the place. Awesome. Wow. And this, um, most of this was unpaid. So that's why I think I enjoy watching people make money. So I will probably be helping people to the day I die if I can because it is it's great. It's so nice to see um, other people make money in property. But anyway, so in two thousand and um, nine sold our entertainment business um so yeah actually, let, let's talk to that because i'm interested because we've gone from one positive cash flow to 14 like yeah what what were the kind of biggest learnings that you took from the first one that you carried on to the the subsequent ones well the first one was negative geared and i just knew yeah. that negative geared properties were going to tie me to a job and positive geared were yeah. going to get me out of a job Can't and i knew that if i was smart enough i could still get some um, capital growth in this mm. and so and although low dock loans aren't around to the extent they were back then the interest rates what I was paying back then were about eight percent it was say, it you know been it was, high at that stage yeah, as well, wasn't it? Yeah. much harder to rent them out I wasn't getting the I mean I was having to push for a really high return immediately um, but mm. I have a whole list of things people can do to do that but ultimately I took on a different strategy with nearly every property I bought <laughs> Okay. So that, <laughs> did that involve mainly renovating for profit or? Uh, some new- of them changing titles. I've got a whole list of them if you want me to start rattling them off. But, but, um, yeah, yes. this is the place yeah, to we go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Give us the goal. But, um, just to finish yeah. off my cute little story. Okay. So we, okay. Okay. we, um, sold our entertainment business, got some equity out of one house and equity out of another and traveled Australia in a caravan homeschooling our kids for two years. It was a Best two years of our lives. Wow. Oh, I love that. That's anyway, a brave woman. Brave just, woman. I had no idea what would come back to, but that was all really good. So <laughs> you want to know what I did to properties? I've, I pretty much did nearly everything on this list. Um, okay. And it Have would got- all be depending on where I was and what I was doing. So there were times where I would take a job to get a loan over the line. Uh, There were other times when when we're travelling Australia, we got offered a job to run a a resort in Victoria and that was so much good. But as soon as we got a job for the first time, we're actually earning. I mean, it was just a minimum wage because you were living in the house. But by the time we were both earning a minimum wage, I went straight back to the lenders and got a lot of our loans off low docks. So I'd choose. And then as soon as we were going to be leaving that job, I knew we were getting back in the caravan. I'd be ready to um, I'd get all my ducks in a row ready to buy the next one, have the pre-approval. Um, so I was always one step ahead um, at mm. all times. So wow. if there was anything that came up, yeah. I was ready to go because you can't procrastinate with these good properties. Okay, so I guess in answer to question, Scott, generally <laughs> um, I don't sell. I'd buy manufactured growth, rent, and then equity grab and use yep. the equity to buy the next one, which makes sense. And I, I knew that every $150,000 of equity I had would probably buy me half a million dollars worth of investment properties. So that's there's probably lots of people. 
Next, yeah. Um, that was what I was about to ask next. What what type of properties were they and where were they? Like what sort of value? Yeah. I, mean, I know we're going back a decade now. Or, or yeah, I've got a few prices have moved since then. But at the oh, time, what numbers were you you looking at as you were building through? 100%. And I've got a few slides that I can show you in a minute yeah. um, of, of some of those properties too. But I guess the, the main thing I did was I'd always buy under median house price. You never okay. saw me pay anything more than median house price, which makes sense. Obviously, the the obvious ones are paint and carpet, change the kitchen, you know, paint the kitchen, change the tops and um, put new handles on. Bathroom, I'd paint the bathroom, um, change the taps. Like They're all things that everyone knows and then choose a good property manager to, cause, to keep the rent at market. Um, but the more in-depth things that I started doing, I knew that when you were on realestate.com, people choose, bed. well, back then you used to do bedrooms and bathrooms. So I knew that if I could create another bedroom in any of these houses I bought, I could make yeah. another one to $5,000 a year just for a stud wall that might cost me $1,500. So I'm going to return anything up to 200% on my money in the first year. Yeah. Um, because the stud wall is only 1500 and I'm at least going to get 1500 or more for the rent. So um, the yeah. tenant would have paid it off in the first year. Obviously, after that's just money in my pocket. It also meant that when I went back to get equity, my house was worth another 20000 at least just from a stud wall. So I'd look at the floor plans when I started mm. out too. Um, obviously, closing in a garage is another thing, um, which I, I have not done that one. Um, another thing is a lot of houses, they come without any kind of outdoor areas. And people look for an outdoor area. I don't like going through council for anything because it usually costs money and it costs time. So I tend to put up shade sales depending on what um, was allowed. You know, you could create something quite easily with a shade sale and it gives you that same sort of illusion. Um, I know Joe's at least... Um, I've been talking a bit about this one, solar panels on your roof, <laughs> solar panels on a rental. Now, remembering this, if you, to my understanding, because I don't sell, all the agents I know will tell me that if you buy a house with solar panels, you won't pay for the solar panels. So it's not necessarily good if you're flipping. But if you are holding oh, for yeah. rental returns, um, tenants all pay for more rent. Now, in Adelaide, I would expect you to get $20 to $40 a week extra rent for solar panels. Now, that's two, anything up to $2,000 a year for the yeah, solar wow. panels that might have cost you $4,000. So it's 50% returns on your money. You're only getting 6 or 7% from your rent. Why can't, you know, let's get 50% for your solar panels for the amount you're spending on the solar panels. So ultimately your tenant is paying off those solar panels in the first two years. After that, mm. it's money in your pocket again. Um, another thing which I've done on a few occasions is add furniture. You, you, you're dealing with a different market, but it depends what you've got. Um, the houses I stay away from with furniture, um, but little units are something that furniture will add. Once again, it's going to be 30 to $50 a week extra rent in the Adelaide market. Wow. Um, and, and 30 yet to $50 the, a week to a unit. For yeah. furniture. Yes. Wow. Yeah. And then you turn it around out. and you think about that. The furniture, if it's, say, $30, $1,500, you can go to somewhere like Ikea and get that. Or you've probably got yeah. leftover furniture in your house that yeah. that you could probably furnish a unit with. Um, there's, there's negatives to that, though. So you're going to have a more transient tenant. I get that. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to be someone that's just moved out with mum and dad or come down to uni or something like that. But at the end of the day, furniture does add value. Um, another one's jewel rents. I, we're in Adelaide. We can't do jewel rents like the, I don't know if it's the whole of Australia, but I certainly know a lot of states will allow you to jewel rent your property out. So you could rent out the, oh, the yeah. granny flat in the back and the house. In South Australia, we're not at that level yet. Um, I'm not sure why, but there's even Fonzie flats as well. So I'd look for dual rent if I was not, you know, when I'm not it's in a Adelaide. Fonzie flat. I missed that one. It's above the garage. Ah. Okay, remember cool. Fonzie? Ah. Yeah, Fonzie totally, flat. but I've never, never heard that yeah. term in my life. That's great. Fonzie <laughs> yeah, flat. Fonzie flat. Yeah. Yeah. yeah There's so, your golden um, nugget, Scotty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I used yeah, to live in a so, cupboard in London, but I, I thought that was cool or unique and edgy, but Fonzie flat would have been heaps better. Yeah, yeah. I, I lived in a garage, um, but not above a garage. Um, there you go. So that. Living the dream. Living the dream. Look at um, us now. 
Yeah, obviously changing the titles on a property, I'll come back to that in a minute. Two properties mm. on the one title, you'll always get them usually at discounted. Um, I used to buy unconditional with some, and I know some people would shudder for that, but if you mm. buy unconditional, um, I did it for with my son only a few months ago. He bought unconditional because when we looked through the house, this is during COVID, I can I can talk to him blue in the face. I've got so many stories, but this this particular one, the tenant um, was in the house paying well under market. Um, yeah. At the beginning of COVID, mm-hmm. all these first-time buyers was, were trying to step in and all the investors were stepping out of the market. Um, so we were one of only a few investors floating around trying to get Benson, our son who works in business, um, his first investment property. And so what happened when we went there, um, this, this particular property had fallen over somebody had offered money and had fallen over because the finance wouldn't get through. So I just instantly knew, okay, Benson, you're going unconditional, um, mm. which means ultimately. And so he paid about ten or 15000 less than the first offer, but he was unconditional. So the vendor knew that we'd settle. Yeah. Um, well, and- that makes such a massive difference. I was literally just speaking to an agent this afternoon who said exactly that. She's like, I just went like, you know, I, there was a property for sale in it. I'm like, hey, how did it go? She's like, yeah, just, just sold it. I'm like, you've only had it on the market like uh, two days. She's like, yeah, we just went on. Un- it's the, it was a cash buyer. They went unconditional, no finance, two day cooling off in Adelaide, yeah. <laughs> and uh, they fully fully accepted it. And uh, he, she's like, she said, I actually had more. I had higher offers, but they were first home buyers, and they were the people that didn't. I didn't trust their finance as much as a cash unconditional because after that cooling off period, it's going to happen. So if they don't pull out within those two days, it'll 100%. it'll go. Yeah, people love like, that. I've got a million of those. Yeah, a million of those stories. Well, I lost last week with a client in Newcastle who was yeah. trying to buy. Sorry, actually, it was in Brisbane trying to buy, and um, he lost paying. I think about ten thousand dollars more than the next best buyer for conditional offer. And I said the same thing to him. Like, if this was in New <laughs> South Wales where you're from, you would buy this with a Section sixty six W certificate and waive that five day cooling off and buy it unconditionally. But for some reason, everyone in Queensland wants a cooling off. He put the cooling off in. I told him he'd lose, and he lost. It's just. <laughs> You know, it's so it, – you've just got to get that mindset right of exactly what you've done your whole career, Prue, isn't it, which is how do you hack this to get the right mm-hmm. result, you yeah. know, the easiest or cheapest way, and that's a really simple way to close deals at a lower – you know, at a, at a better rate. It's a bit scary because I did actually try and buy one once and um, nearly couldn't get the finance. That was scary. <laughs> but, I mean, so I guess I, I'm – yeah, I'm usually um, – usually one step ahead but that particular time I wasn't um wow but, but it's interesting I guess that the the quirky ones the ones with bad tenants on low rent you'll always get them especially if they're stuck on a lease you'll usually get them for a good price and there's a few of those those around um yeah. the other thing is bad agents seriously I made a hundred thousand dollars on a bad agent dead set yeah. <laughs> um he was someone that didn't have an a phone number like a mobile phone number didn't have a website wouldn't return my calls um, and it was a block of units of all things. Um, oh, I can wow. come back to that too. But and it was interstate, so I bought sight unseen. Un, um, un, I was going to say unconditional, unconditional finance. But I, I, want, I gave a seven day. I wanted to view it within seven days, and I had no idea whether this guy had accepted this offer. It was a really stressful time, but in the end, it was so amazing. And it's just another another thing I recognise. If this guy's not returning my calls. He's not returning anyone's calls. Yeah. <laughs> Guess so what? I knew yeah. that if I just if I just keep at him, you know, like I, I just have to break through. And I remember Andy saying to me, "I'd give up, Pru. I said, "Just let me have two more, like two more goes." I know, like this one here's just too good to walk from, because I bought a block of units for three hundred and twenty thousand dollars in Moi, and they should have been, and they were already on separate titles, and it wow. should have been more like five hundred thousand, four fifty to five hundred back then. Crazy, but he had a. Obviously, the I, I did find out the story. The the um, vendor had passed away. He'd left two of his units to his wife, and the other two to his girlfriend. <laughs> so you can imagine these two. It wasn't a great scenario. And then they had an agent that didn't have a mobile phone number and didn't have a website. It wasn't part of the Real Estate Institute Victoria either, by the way. Um, wasn't a, a member, so it was it was messy. I think I just have you just have to choose your battles you have to choose what you need to, what strategy you need to do with each property under whatever situation Absolutely. it is at that time and where yeah. you're at as well um but i think that 
you know, good properties go fast. So you sort of need to have your deposit ready and don't procrastinate. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's how I'm trying that's to stitch fun. up a lot of my, well, how to, how to set up a lot of clients now is like, can you go unconditional? If you can, it's better because it's going to help us in our negotiation and we can save a little bit of, we can we can actually save more money. We will make more money yes. by going unconditional. Yeah. So, um, but that's the great thing about Adelaide, right? You have a two-day cooling off period that is, you can actually pull out of the deal within two days and you can run a pest and building within those two days to be able to pull out. So, yeah. Um, and- yeah, and keep things out of the conditions so it looks like there's yeah. a lot less for the vendor to accept. In terms of the cooling off, though, like this is a it's a big thing that pe- a lot of people just completely underestimate and don't quite understand the difference between it because they're just, you know, they're trained a certain <laughs> way or they've they've only been told, you know, friends or family have bought certain ways or they're used to it because the agents have told them that that's an opportunity you know, option that they can do. Joe mm. and I have talked about it before. Like in southeast Queensland, for example, right across Queensland, but southeast Queensland is insane still that often um, I'll compete with somewhere between 15 and the best I've ever been in is a 52-person contract race um, with formal contract offers on the same day at the same time. And I spoke to the agent after that, which we won that one, and he said 48 of them were conditional on finance and went straight in the bin. Um, well, actually 50 of them, and then there was two that was it was between you and someone else that was unconditional. So it literally is just life or death, black or white. Yeah. yeah. And that's what I just keep hearing from agents is they just rip it up and put it in the bin. So you're just completely wasting your own time unless you come up with a solution to beat the market. Yeah, I bought one in December as well, another investment property ourselves in December and four months ago. And ultimately um, it was a a great buy, but um, I I felt that the agent, um, she was adorable. She might be watching, which makes me feel really bad. (laughs) Um, she wanted to know our offer well before the closing date and I just didn't give it to her. I just didn't give it to her because I didn't want it to be ammo um, for others because I don't, you know, I don't I don't know, but ultimately the more information I can hold on and I just I sent it through at the 11th hour and we got that one. Um, mm. But I tend to also, I mean, this is more Scott's side, I'm sure, but I tend to not put zeros and fives on the end of our offers either. So if it if it's worth six hundred thousand to me, I'll go six hundred and six thousand seven hundred, or something sort of like that. So I'm getting them on the five, and I'm getting them on the zeros, if that makes sense. And I know we've got two or three because of that. Um, yeah. Just because of that one little little tactic because you go on realestate.com or rp data core logic and you'll see most people pay zeros and fives um i don't pay zeros and fives not now (laughs) i think you get more educated as you go along too um yeah good little trick to use especially in sealed bids that one that works Mm -hmm. really well in sealed bids yeah definitely not auction (laughs) no (laughs) no definitely not um but i guess the yeah, i i think that's probably i can go to my slides now if you want me to joe or what yeah, well, um, let's go. Let's cover off what the that first. Well, let's go to the slides, and then you'll tell us what the slides are. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. If I can do it, let's hope we don't lose me. This, um, yeah, just everyone yeah. watching. I just lost them before, and I tried to do this share screen. Okay, you share. Share screen. Double click. Share. Boom. Okay, here we go. Okay. Going in the matrix, and then you open Excellent. up the slides, full screen. Perfect. I really have looking at proof. Uh, my first investment, this was a little house I bought around the around the corner, and I thought That's it cute. might be nice for you to see. It's a little two bed, one bath. The interesting thing about that, that'd only be worth land value now. It's a little two bed, one bath. So at the moment, it would probably be worth I bought it for two hundred and twenty thousand sorry, numbers. Bought it for two hundred and twenty thousand dollars in two thousand and six. Wow. It would now be worth about six hundred and fifty thousand. We should play a guessing game on each one of them. Like, okay, what's the <laughs> <Yeah>. today? <laughs> oh, let's go. I'm happy to do it. Hey, um, so what do you reckon it rent rent what do you reckon it rented for in 2006 and what do you think it rents for now? Uh, hmm. I reckon it rented for 350 in 2006 and I reckon it rents for 600 a week now. Okay. Oh, I don't know. Uh, it won't be 600 a week now. It'll be where is it? It's it's a it's at Hove. So Hove is just about ten minutes down the hill, back towards the city from Hallett Cove. Oh, okay. Or, oh, we're say... about five minutes from Glenelg. 
Oh, come oh, on, Joe's oh, got heaps more information from... than I had now. That's yeah, not... sorry. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm going to say 420. 420 now. And what did it rent out originally? Um, yeah, I bought it for 220000 in 2006. Okay, and, you're and a, now... you, you play the yield as well. So, it was, <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to say 220. Oh, my God, Joe, you have pretty much nailed that. So, oh, yeah, in 2006, um, we got $220 a week, bought it for $220,000. Yes. Which is, which is very typical of Adelaide's market, by the way. It's quite easy to get 5% here. Five to I was used to chase sort of 8 but 5 to 6% is quite easy. And the, um, now it's only getting $450 a week, but it's worth 650000 So you can see that. If we take that down and put a, a four bed two bath on that, it'd probably be worth one point two because it's opposite a park. It's in a really lovely little spot. Um, wow! But but anyway, I just thought I'd show you that one. I'm really proud of that. But that was negative geared at two hundred and twenty dollars a week. Remembering our interest rates were about eight percent when we bought that. That's what threw me. I went for the positively geared, you know, strong yield, and I got burned. Yeah, sorry I'm about not that. It's just, anymore. I'm done on that. You now. learn you learn as you go. I haven't got many slides, but you learn as you go. So that was when I realized, <laughs> hang on a minute. I knew that in about five years it'd be neutrally geared. And I thought if I could just hold on for five years, I knew the capital growth would be much better than that. Mm. Um so even at say six percent, six that's um twelve hundred sorry. 1200 email. Sorry, my brain's not working because it's evening and I've had a glass of wine. So, but at the end of the day, it worked out that it was still making me money. If I had a capital growth and rent together, it was still going to make me money in the future. And that's what I was looking for. Yeah. But we couldn't afford to carry a few of those sorts of properties. So that's when I yes. started reading. Yes. Um, so the well, next one is. Um, let's play Let's play a game with this one. The audience has reached out. Someone said, this is, this is a question. Oh, wait, hang on. Can we play this? Can we play along at home? <laughs> <laughs> they might be people that know me. That they know the numbers. Who knows? Yeah. Um, Cheating. They've been to the University of South Australia. They, they... <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Um, so this one here, um, the only reason I put this in, because this is just a typical reno that I do. So if you can see the, um, the kitchen on the right-hand side, um, yeah. the bottom – that's obviously a before and an after on the right-hand side. Now, that mm -hmm. kitchen there would have cost us no more than $1,000 for the bench tops, probably about $150 for the new chrome handles, and the paint might have been $600. Now, that looks like a new kitchen. Yeah, amazing. So, Great yeah. turnaround. So, now, we sold that. Um, bless him. We, we used Todd Sloan. He oh. sold this one. For us. Oh, nice. So, and he did an amazing nice. job. So, basically, before I did the reno, Todd said this was this was in two thousand and one. So, I only sold it last year. Um, so, this was valued at about three hundred thousand dollars. Okay. Um, and we only spent sixteen thousand on renovating it, which pretty much everything was paint. Uh, there was a few other things, but ultimately, the whole cost was about sixteen thousand. Um, it was staged for about three thousand dollars so the furniture wow. in this grill um and then we sold it for four hundred and thirty nine thousand so um thanks to todd a bit of paint and some um um some carpet and stage furniture we made one hundred and twenty thousand profit in two months nice right. happy birthday toddy as well today oh yes uh, from yesterday birthday. um so oh, yeah. normally i wouldn't i wouldn't um talk too much about that but it just I think what happens is people think when they do a renovation, they've got to rip everything out. If the carcass mm. is good in the kitchen, why not keep it? Change the bench tops, the handles, and paint the cupboards because it it works. Yeah, that looks fantastic. It looks like yeah. it's brand new. Great yeah, it, it does, and it did. Um, so the next one's actually the bathroom in the same property. So what do you think I did there, boys? <laughs> Swap the – did you – Tile so paint over the basin, like take oh, top, yeah. top something and put something new in there, and you've just painted over the tiles and you put new taps in, and then redid the bath. Did you recover the bath and then put yeah. the looks like the same shower? Is it? Yep, exactly the same shower because we had a leak there a few years, well, probably five years before that, and we had to replace the tiles. So we end up just putting white tiles, could never replace the same fancy tiles that were on the other side of the bathroom. And why would you? Um, so, yeah, so that was all painted. Now, 
Um, the paint, uh, so, and the vanity was changed, obviously. Really, other than a vanity and some paint, that's what that was. The um, So people are worried about painting baths, and they probably need to. You need to do it right or get someone professional to do that. Yeah. Um, there's a company that I don't know whether I should say their name, but they come in and give you like a five to ten year guarantee and everything on baths. And a white bath always looks better than a yellow bath, you know. <laughs> I think mean, that, that changes that whole bathroom it the, did. The, the uplift of the bath makes a huge difference. They're obviously painting over the tiles and making everything white. Totally. Yeah, the, the bath really ages it very quickly, just like the basin does. So that's a really good value add. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what in actual cost fact, to do, do that, did you say a rough sort of cost? Of, well, oh, the vanity itself is about $200. Uh, Might have been $250, but it, um, you could get them cheaper. You could get them on Gumtree anywhere, really. The vanity, it just needed but, to fit but in. Painting there. the bath specifically? Yeah, the yeah. rest was just painting. So I just had a professional come in and do it, but he was doing the entire house. So that uh, whole section wouldn't have cost any more than the kitchen. So it might have cost $1,000, $1,500. So it's not a specialist trade that you need to do other than a painter that's doing the rest I of had a painter. Out. I actually had a painter that he's a painter first and a handyman second. So he, was, he okay. knew how to do all this. So it is probably a little bit specialised, but nothing that – Nothing that's that expensive. I think there are people out there doing it themselves. But um, if you're renting a house, the longevity, you're best to have someone professional do it, obviously, because you're going to end up having to paint it over and over again. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, definitely. I totally agree. Because you see those when they're terribly done and you just know and they start flaking. And as soon as it starts, a flaking white bath is much worse than a yellow bath. Yeah. (laughs) Yellow shining through. Um, 100%. one thing you mentioned is you spent three thousand dollars on staging. Um, yeah, I, I want to get your opinion on that because uh, I see it a lot of staging. Um, and is it worth it? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. In, in if you're selling, yes. In my opinion, if you're renting, no. But you see what we do now. You can actually have photographs staged. <clears throat> so we um, <clears throat> we have a photographer. Sorry, I've got a frog in my throat. <clears throat> we have a photographer that we use um, at. Muir Property Management, and he takes photos and then um, two days later he can superimpose fo- um, furniture into the photos. Yeah. And I nearly gave you a slide on that, but I decided I don't want to sort of bore you with slides, but it looks incredible. So for rental, for the sake of $55 per photo, and usually we do the lounge, dining and master bedroom, so it's $110 for just to stage the photos, but they're the, they're the hero photos and they're the ones that bring people into the open inspections. And as soon as they're at the open inspections for rentals, you know, we can do our job and, you know, sell the property to them as property managers, if that makes sense. You talked about ways of, like, increasing the yield and, you know, long-term driving more ROI. That's a really good one because for $110 or whatever, they're they're not evergreen. Like, they might change over time, but they're going to last years and years. If you have to keep releasing that property, you're going to have beautiful photos to use consistently, which does definitely a hundred percent. And the other thing that adds value is doing an open. Although we we're there for sort of forty five minutes doing opens, we only advertise fifteen, so everyone's there at the same time. So it means that when they're there at the same time, they panic, which is really sad in this market because we've seen some sad stories lately. But anyway, that and then they offer you more money. More. I was rent. talking to a rental agent today on the Gold Coast, and he said he had a property at um, seventeen hundred dollars a week this week, and they had one hundred tenants at the open for inspection. Wow. <laughs> How do you compete? 1700 bucks a week. I don't know if, yeah. if that's true or not, but that number is just insane. We yeah. did two tonight um, and one's a three bed with a swimming pool. We had um, 28 odd groups through that and yeah. we, will, we would already have that in applications and we did another one that's about $800 um, a week. And we had 15 groups through that. So Adelaide is a different market. We're, you know, we're a bit lower in the returns, but lower in the purchase price too. So um, that's sort of what we're seeing. But we would have got probably close between uh, close to 100 inquiries on everything. It's it's really sad, um, really really sad. In fact, yeah. the guy that got today's property from we did two opens, like two lots of open inspections last night too. With the gentleman that got one of the properties today, he just loved Andy when he rang him, and he apparently saw him at the open and gave him a big whopping hug. All these sorts of things because they just these poor people they they're struggling to get housing. 
There's, mm. there's no like, stock. Like we're just so no. far down on stock. Like it, in where we are at the moment, it's I just leased a new property yesterday because we've just sold and we're renting while we um, build a development site. And we, I couldn't find anything. And I, I basically took a property sight unseen at the full asking price for a year lease just to jump yeah. the queue so they didn't have to open for inspection and um my property which i was breaking the lease which we just sold and i had leased back and we're breaking it for a particular reason and uh the property manager i spoke to today said oh there's no you know you're very optimistic if you think you're going to get that rent you you know you kind of over committed to it when you sold the property and, and overpriced it and i was like that's interesting and then i rang my rental agent to ask when the open for inspection would start this saturday and he said i already leased it to someone in china last night at the full price so there's no open yep. inspection it's already done yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. There's just that people aren't, the, the the listings aren't even going to to market, and and there's just it, no new supply at all. It's so sad. I mean, it's really really sad. So we're seeing these poor people and the desperation in their applications mm -hmm. to us too, and the fact you know they consistently keep ringing us because they're just so desperate. Um, so. The bottom line is they need to pay their rent on time or they're not going to get a house in this market at all. You know, like yep. if their references aren't strong, they're not going to get a property. We had one that had applied on tenant options, which is just a place where tenants apply for properties. So it's not used by every agent. That applied to 84 properties. Wow. So, wow. Prue, can you give us a little bit of gold here? If you're looking for a rental property, and I know there'll be tons of people that watch this back, um, what can you do to put yourself ahead of the pack as a tenant? Like I hear a lot of stories about people offering longer leases, offering um, to pay in advance for a big chunk of the rent, offering over the rent, obviously. to um, I'm constantly seeing this in southeast Queensland where I am. What are some of the things you're seeing in Adelaide and what are some of the you know tips that you might you might be able to give some tenants that are looking and struggling? Yeah, 100%. Um, choose... Apply to properties that are th that are within your price range. So that would be three times. If you're earning, um, if you're applying for a property that's three hundred and fifty dollars, you need to be earning three times that as as a joint income. So whoever's living in the property, they need to be earning three times the weekly rent in their wages. So stick within yeah. that, or that you're going to be, generally speaking, that's kind of it's not a rule of thumb, but it's something that we all watch out for. We want to know they can afford it. Um, number two is if you love something that much, do offer more money. It sounds really bad, but they're the ones that are getting mm. the houses right now. Um, you know, we're getting anything up to $100 over the asking price for houses at the moment. But what generally we? speaking, if I'm trying yeah. to help people listen, I can only really talk for South Australia. Most of the ones that are coming in are no longer 5 or $10 above. They're coming in between, say, $20 and $30 above. So that's probably the average amount that people are putting on top of the asking rent. And, and the are you jacking the price up before that happens by 20 or 30 in, to begin with? No, no we're putting I it. We've so you off screen, Prue. We're just getting the side of you. We're getting your shoulder. Oh, there we go. yeah. I that's thought better. that. Have I lost you? <laughs> yeah. I thought I was sharing. Oh, you were on the screen share. I was yeah. still in. Yeah, sorry, hold on. No, yeah, we can see your pretty face again. Yeah. Here we, we go. Hello. Up. Yeah. How long have you been off? The, how long have I been off the share screen? Oh, 30 minutes or so, not long. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really, really sad. It's really sad. Um, so, yeah, are you jacking going? the price up when? So, when you go to release something or a new rental, are you, you know, coming in at five hundred dollars a week and then going? Actually, people are going to come in at five twenty-five, five thirty. So, let's try it at five twenty-five, or and then they're coming in at five fifty. So, is it? Are we seeing kind of people getting ten percent overs on where you, you know, estimate the market value might be to begin with? Um, property management. No, what happens is what I'll go. RP Data and Core Logic is now too old. For us, yeah. so I usually just go straight to realestate.com, see if there's anything that's comparable, and I go on about that. I've got a pretty good idea, but it will depend on what's on the market on that day as to what I'll go on at. Yeah. So, um, in answer to the question, I guess it I go in at market rent. So whether that's the higher one, and yes, they are considerably higher than what they were before. Um, you know what they were 12 months ago. I'm putting up all the rents are going up constantly, yeah. um, and it's really sad. So I just give the respect to the tenants, give them a call and sort of explain, look, this is the market. I send them the link so it's honest and open and say, look, you know, this particular owner wants us to stay within market um, and we never usually go up to market completely but just a little less. So, yeah. Hmm. Um, do you want me to go back to my share screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, one more slide and I'll try not to disappear off screen. <laughs> um, 
So I'll go share screen. Where are we? Sorry. Yeah, oh, you're doing you it for me. Yeah. Oh, look at that. All right. So Great I just want to show you, show you this one. My first uh, block of units. <laughs> all right. So, um, so what I learned was the cheaper the property, the higher the yield. Okay. Um, I, I don't. I never really wanted to get involved in single units because I didn't want someone else controlling me. So that's strata. I'm talking strata now. Um, so I thought, okay, well, I wonder if I could buy blocks of units. And this is actually what my dad and mum used to do. Um, so I was sort of aware that they were around. And when you buy a block of units on one title, it's like buying houses on sale. Like the end value is much different to what you should be buying it for if it's on one title. So this particular block of units is, this one's in Mildura. Um, and if anyone wants me to email them or I can send it to Joe and he can do it, that minimal effort up the top right-hand side, there's just an article that ran in the Australian Property Investor API magazine some time ago about me, about that particular deal. So it's got all the numbers. But in 2008, this is my first block. We've got a second since that. Um, so I paid 330000 for four two-bed units. Wow. Two so bed. you probably think then I had to get a low-doc commercial loan. So you can imagine mm. how much I had to pay for that. But I knew that if I um, bought these these units and I had to do anything to get it over the line because I knew the true value was more like, um, well, it was actually 520000 So I bought that for 330000 but the end value, once they're on separate titles, was 520000 So it's nearly $200,000 more. Um, so then I went to council and I put them on separate titles. I did that while traveling Australia. I paid someone <laughs> about $1,200 $1, and it only cost us $12,000 to separate these units. So, okay. And then you got an extra, so $12,000 essentially gave you $200,000. Yep, a net profit of $178,000. Yeah, and then I went back. I was, remember, I'm on a low dot commercial loan at this stage, knowing that this was such a good deal we had to do something with it. So then I went back to, um, then I went to the CBA when I became a normal person because four properties on the one title does sort of force you to go to a second tier or third tier lender, not your big four. Um, yeah. And you will pay a much higher interest rate. Um, but it, it was so worth it and I did this with the other one too. So, um, and then Commonwealth Bank saw them as individual units, and this is only yeah. six months later. They valued it at five hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Wow! And gave us gave us all the cash out or the line of credit offset account, and then I used that as a deposit to buy more. As long as I wasn't using the cash um, or the equity in any property to do something per on personal level, it meant that it stayed tax deductible. So I could, you know, by buying more properties with the um, with the equity, uh, it created, it was still um, tax deductible debt, which is why angle. So this particular bl block of units are in Mildura. I'm not telling everyone to go to Mildura because there was no capital growth and now there's been a massive amount. Um, but these units would now be worth about 800000 I think. Um, the rent, no. Oh, the, the block. block. Now yeah. that's end value. So that's if I sold them individually. So it'd be about $200,000 each. Yeah. Um, but that's end value and the rent's $900 a week now. So if someone was to buy this right now, say they were on one, one title right now, you'd probably buy this block of units for more like um, probably about 600000 maybe and you'd be getting $900 a week rent. <clears throat> so that's 7 8% yield. And how long did you hold that for? That so... so we bought these in 2008. We'll okay. So, but I've bought another lot since that with through the lazy agent. That was fun. Um, through the lazy agent, we're back off the screen I'm now. Sure we jump off to uh, the normal screen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. You're We've warning me now. Yeah, yeah, you get a you get, you get do that. I'm, I'm, I'm always interested. <laughs> I've asked this question before um, when we've been talking to investors. Is what's your view on buying lots of cheap properties with high yields in regional areas versus? Um, more expensive and a simple strategy where you kind of just buy and hold, for example, or buy and add a little bit of value to one property and hold long term. So a lot less work than what you've just gone through and explained um, and better growth. Like, for example, my maths there, if you obviously saw an uplift 
in the property value, which took it to about 130,000 per lot when it was valued at 520 grand. Yeah. If they're worth 200 grand now, you've seen, you know, over 2009, was it? Yeah, 2008. 2008. So 14 yep. years later, 50% growth versus yeah. some suburbs, for example, you know, that have seen 40, 50% growth in the last 12 months alone yeah. and have seen consistent growth of 7 to 10% yep. every year over yep. the course of that. So there's different, there's horses for courses here in terms of strategy, isn't it? But your views, obviously, yeah. we're only obviously at the start of the journey and learning all this. Obviously, this has worked tremendously well for you and built this enormous cash cow. Yeah. And, and great positive um, philosophy or overall. But, yeah, it's interesting to break this down because you could buy one or two properties and do something similar if people are looking at, you know, I don't have the time or I don't have the capacity to do these things as well. Well, that one there didn't – I just had to sign some documents mm. and I made 100. And someone else did all the work. I love it. Um, yeah. So, yeah. so and I guess I bought it for 330000 yeah, and they're worth about eight hundred thousand now, so it's only three times. You know, it's up around three. But it, the interesting thing is that I had to chase positive geared properties, and mm. I know Mildura, and I don't quote me on this because I don't have the numbers, but it was that they were only going up about two percent a year, whereas like Adelaide was sort of flying along at say four or five percent. So, and I knew that, um, but the returns it was making me. I mean, I paid three hundred and thirty thousand for that, and you know, we're getting nine hundred dollars a week. Sorry, eight hundred. $900 a week rent now. Now, don't forget, I've never even painted one of those units. Brilliant. I haven't done like interior? Brilliant. But so also the, I love what, the fact that you've, you've gone and, you know, you've sought these investments because you're looking for the value and that's the, that's the thing that people just aren't doing enough. Like you've gone out of your comfort zone. You could have bought in an area that was slightly better growth perhaps, but it wouldn't have given you those yields and wouldn't allowed you to keep growing your portfolio. But no. then better still, you've found those ones where you can add instant value at low cost, not a lot of work, as you just explained. That's brilliant strategy. I and mean, there was can another... be doing that in lots of different areas. Oh, 100%. I went online. See, a lot of people, those that are listening, if you go looking for blocks of units, they are there are still quite a lot of them on one title. You, um, you don't realise, most people don't realise, on realestate.com there's actually an icon that you call up blocks of units. Now, you find some lazy agents will put a single unit under blocks of units. So just put the most expensive first. Then you'll, you you know, you'll knock out the Sorry, what? single unit. Can you show us? You can screen share. Can you oh. show us what you're talking about in real estate? Oh, it's, is that, it's, is it's that... just in the search function like that. You can, you can search it. But what I used to do when I was an agent is search nationally via a particular yield. So I would just type in, there used to be a search box in it. You could oh. type in 7% or 8% or whatever you wanted to as a keyword. It would do a keyword search. So all the agents oh, that anything to do with a particularly high return, I would just uh, bring up all those listings nationally. Uh, the other thing I used to do like yeah. that is um, anything with DA approved on it. So yeah. you could go and find all these things that people had already done all the hard work for you to your point yeah. about, you know, you just go in there and add a little bit of vision or, or actually complete the work and then you yeah. see all the uplift. You don't have to get stuck with council or the, the cost of architects and drawings and things as well. So, yeah, there's definitely ways of hacking the system, but some yeah. of these things have changed over time as well. That's so oh, true, yeah. You can type in, yeah. I, I typed in renovators delight. Uh, that was my yeah. that was my that was my keyword. Uh, yeah. or, or was it just delight? Um, because there, it was never a, there was never any other word out in a listing with the word delight in it that wasn't a <laughs> renovator's delight. <laughs> Actually, you can also find renovation properties in land. Some yeah, agents will put that property under uh, land. Oh, because land value, land value yeah. only. Land value only. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting, but yeah, but remembering I, my strategy then was to sell one a year once I retire. And I guess, you know, maybe a little renovation be good because they could probably be worth 250,000. If I fix that block mm, of units, 200 grand, 250 to 300,000 each, if mm. I wanted to, I just, we just haven't done anything with them. We've, they've just sat there. Yeah. Um, and we've to. got a couple of little blocks of units like that. So I think when people hear, oh, you've got a couple of blocks of units, they think we've paid some ridiculous so amount for them. Can we dial that, that statement back that you just said then and take it back to earlier in the chat? If you're sitting on an asset that just needs a little bit of a tart up and you can do it really cheaply to dramatically increase the return on investment, why haven't you done that on that apartment block already? Yeah, right. Well, I've... Sorry, <laughs> I'm interested. I'm just thinking, yeah, that's yeah. A, that fits in the box that you just said. 
Yeah, um, in Victoria, there's a lot of changes happening with property managers. So we've got to change the heating and cooling, and there's there's a few things with with that. But no, you're absolutely right. My intention is that when we retire, we could sell one of those a year. So we'd go up and fix it ourselves if we choose to. Um, remembering Benson will take our son is the is our future in the business. So he's you know he owns an investment property and um, he's de- doing his diploma. So he's like our future out if that makes sense. <laughs> um, so yeah, the whole the whole thing is interesting. But we have choice. You see, if I'd put three hundred thirty thousand dollars into one house that was returning back then um, six hundred dollars a week. I couldn't sell it off separately. I've got yeah. much, so many more options with a little block of units. And I know I could put furniture in one. I could put solar panels on the roof. I could make that the best rental returns anyone's ever seen. Um, yeah. But I just haven't. Yeah, um, it's easy to manage four in one go on one spot too. Like it's a nice, easy, straightforward one. And the buildings like that of that age are actually really cost effective to renovate because they're pretty solid, aren't they? They're just basically yeah, really brick solid. and pretty easy. Absolutely Not lots right. of outside space. Most of it was concreted. Um, yeah. So, yeah, they're pretty easy long-term investments to hold, which is brilliant too. They wash yeah. themselves off their own face. Yeah. And, yeah, absolutely. So that's that's just sort of um, explaining. Yeah, and, of course, we've got our own prop- – as much as we're property managers, we can only look after our little patch close to where our office is. So we've got – I've got five or six property managers around Australia doing the other ones we own. So I think that's about distance, I reckon, Scott. If that was somewhere closer to Adelaide, we'd do it. Sure, I was just giving you a hard time, Bruce. Sorry. No, no, I can't ask anything because if you did, it makes me go, hang on, why haven't we? Because we, you know, that would be good. Yeah. I'm sure, like, with this much going on in your life, I'm sure you've got other fish to fry anyway. Yeah, <laughs> and I guess we've just been there there. renovated yeah. two houses in the last 12 months and bought three. So I'll kind of, yeah, my focus isn't. Yeah, it should be. Nah, yeah, I might think about that now. <laughs> yeah, it's always the case. Like I've got, I've got a place that I should develop on and like subdivide. I'm just like, I just don't have the time. But I, yeah. I know it's a good deal. I know it's there. Um, but it's going to stay there and be there. So I'll do it later. <laughs> yeah. Um, not that's not a good excuse though for me. Uh, um, but what what I'm interested in is because like we're we're talking about a lot of the past and the, there's a lot that's changed, but. As you just said, I renovated two properties and bought three properties. So I'd love to dive into where the opportunities that you see now um, and where people can get into the market now because it's it's quite challenging yeah. for people, but there are still so many opportunities out there. So before we jump oh. into that, we'll jump into our next sponsor, our final sponsor of the evening, and then we will jump into the answer those questions. So let's do this smoothly. <laughs> the word. <laughs> Uh, 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 uh. Oh the amazing thing with commercial property investing is that in most cases it's cash flow positive from day one, which means that you can drive those profits towards paying down the debt. There are instances with commercial property investing where you can actually have the property pay itself off over 10 years, which is absolutely crazy. With commercial property, you get massive net yield, so you can expect anywhere between 6 to 10%. And as we've seen in the current boom, these properties not only provide large cash flow, they do certainly grow wildly in value too. Now, with big rewards comes some risk, and this is why you should de-risk your investment as much as possible. And the way you do that is with expert due diligence. And this is why we highly recommend people hire professionals to help you along in your investing journey. Steve Polisi of Polisi Property is one such expert. Being a chartered mechanical and structural engineer in a past life, Steve draws on his analytical and mathematical skills to do that expert due diligence for you. With six years experience in the space, Steve has over 1,200 property transactions under his belt. He's the guy you want in your corner, crunching the numbers and finding the best properties in the best locations, along with ensuring that you avoid the mistakes. Steve has actually even written a book on commercial property investing in Australia. And not only is it a bestseller, I believe it to be the most comprehensive in commercial property investing on the market today. He's been generous enough to give us a massive discount for our audience of 50%. So use the code OZPROP, click the link below, get a copy today and start learning and getting on your commercial property investing journey. There it is. Lovely. Okay, I've changed my question, Pru. I've changed my question. Um, my question for you is, um, what is your advice? Because you have two young kids. 
Um, what is your advice for the youngsters um, starting out in their property investing journey? Actually, I, the, my kids aren't young anymore. Um, <laughs> so I've got a 21 and a 23-year-old, and they've both, like I said, bought an investment property during COVID. So I have certainly, I'm sort of holding their hand, which is exactly where you want it to be. That's young. Um, I do, during, when they were growing up, um, because I was so worried about our future financially because we weren't making very much money um, in our DJ business, that in actual fact, um, right from the word go, I got them to spend and save 50%. Now, that sounds too simple, but ultimately it meant that when they got to this age, so when they started working, they were still spending and saving and and. Um, I hope Casey and Benny are watching here. <laughs> but there were many times where, where we would have brawls in that back room. I've worked for, you know, because um, Benson worked for Woolworths for about four years and Casey was working in childcare for four years. And so they were, I, you, know, I, you know, I should be able to spend what I've earned. I said, no, one day you'll thank me. One day you'll thank me. And, of course, they've both thanked me now because Casey bought a house with her savings. Um, she's 23. Um, she bought a house about 18 months ago um, at, the, at the height of COVID when all the first home buyers were trying to get in, not the investors, and she bought as an investor. Um, and so she's already got $130,000 equity in that awesome. home at 23. Wow. So she's ready Brilliant. to buy another one. Um, <laughs> yeah. Just got to wait to get wow. it fixed. She's on fixed for two years. Um, and, and like I said, yeah. my son, he bought one only about six months ago, and that was the one where we did unconditional. I said, I think we just have to go unconditional on this one, lovey. And he was totally for it because um, he'd had a pre-approval anyway. So my my thing would be um, they don't need to buy somewhere they're going to live forever, mm. you know. They, I remember reading somewhere that it's better almost to buy an investment home and rent where you want to live. And, I mean, mm. it's it, you know, you can – decide whether that's good or bad but at the end of the day yes my kids had to save half the whole way long birthday money the whole lot so yeah, um, right. yeah. and Adelaide <laughs> is a bit cheaper to get into than other states I get that but it doesn't mean that they're the first time buyer can't buy an interstate property totally and it's the it's the grounding that you've given them in those you know philosophies around money and yeah. building wealth long term that obviously has set them on the right path so great role models and hard-working oh, parents that have led the way well done yeah, and seeing how story. hard it is right now for these young ones it's like i'm so thankful that they've got somewhere to go if they choose to you know yeah mm. i bet that's incredibly rewarding for you and andy to have yeah, both of them already so. set up at that age 21 and 23 well yeah. done yeah. yeah and and i guess that's kind of uh, like the advice is get in as as soon as you have the opportunity because you don't know what the future holds right you don't know if property prices are going to go absolutely crazy and gangbuster but get in if you if you've got the borrowing capacity if you've got the cash if you've got the buffers then you know get into property um as well while, while you're while you're young because it's going to compound over the years not financial advice obviously i'm not giving out financial advice but <laughs> it is uh some information there so where are some what are some of the opportunities that you've kind of seen around around the traps pru are there any things that are kind of standing out because you've been crushing these units and turning them into single title from single from one yeah. title to multiple titles like what are you, are you seeing anything else out there yeah actually i had a look at blocks of units around australia a couple of nights ago knowing that okay. i'd probably talk about this and there definitely is plenty of them the problem is that you've got to be careful that the agents aren't selling them at end value which is what they're mm -hmm. worth if they're on separate titles mm -hmm. um my experience and once again this isn't financial advice i'd sort of expect to pay about 70 percent of end value if i was buying a block of units and i also know that although it only cost us twelve thousand dollars to go from one title in victoria to four um, if we were on the other side of the street, it would have been $3,000 less. But if we were on the other side of the river in New South Wales, it would have cost more like $100,000 difference. So wow. you've got to be really, really aware. Mm. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. So find your spot, then find your units first. Is, and then is typically if, if you're buying those assets and you're doing it on a low dock loan and potentially com as a commercial purchase, you're talking about sort of a 40% deposit? You're required yeah, usually, that before like you can that. go through the process of changing it over and yeah. remortgaging. Yeah, yeah, so it's quite a hefty outlay, isn't it, in terms of a, it is. a, where and you a are in the of, journey. We we own all these houses. I've only ever put $22,000 into a home to start with and that's it. The rest has come from equity. Really? So that's why it had to happen, why I had to make these worth more. 
Um, so we did a massive renovation, turned a three bed, two living area, one bathroom into a five bed, two living, two bathroom house. Um, Crazy, um, isn't that, it? That was just before we travelled Australia. Yeah, I mean, it's good fun too. It kind of reminds um, me of that story. Like that'd be a great book to write, you know, on your deathbed later. Not that I'm wishing that you're going to be on your deathbed anytime soon, but um, <laughs> obviously, yes, but I like know. turning twenty-two grand into like this amazing puzzle that you know takes just keeps growing, growing, growing. It reminds me of that YouTube dude that did. Um, he swapped a paperclip, um, you know, <laughs> into something else into something else into something else, and turned it into a house. <laughs> yeah, he was like it's nineteen not- or something or eighteen. Yeah. Paper clip, like- little red paper clip. Yeah, <laughs> so good, so good. So, so it's really what, crazy. Why are things on one? Like, why do they even exist? Why does it exist on one title? And why? And can everything be sub like split up? Like, is it just like, oh, it just hasn't been split yet? Like, like you can a question find out those- here is when you separate titles, do you need to change anything on the units, like firewalls? So right, yeah. usually the way. Uh, remember, this isn't financial advice. Um, <laughs> usually, if the if the property has been built as units, it's acceptable to the council to keep it that way. So, um, like, because I've got a couple of I've got a double semi as well um, in Adelaide, um, which is you know once again that's on a single title. And from what I understand, when I um, separated the titles on the two blocks, is that as long as it was built for that purpose the council are okay with it Mm. because if they're built before a certain year, blah, 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 it's okay. So um, I think one of those questions you do need to talk to the council this block of units is part of, and they won't guarantee anything. So once again, you're going to take a little bit of a risk, but it's a calculated risk. Every every time it's a calculated risk. And I was going to get a 10% yield on it anyway, so I knew it wasn't negative geared and it was a good launching pad. So, um, and that was quite early on in our investing was that block of units. So, and that that would have bought us, I mean, the 160000 would have bought us another hundred, another half a million dollars worth of investment properties, just that, mm. um, because on separate titles, they're worth more. And it gives me more choice. We can sell them off individually as well. One thing mm. I really love about that strategy too is what I see a lot um, now, and I'm sure this has happened a lot over over generations, is that these types of properties often get, picked up by one or a neighboring lot as a development site over time as well. So if you buy close to something that might get rezoned in terms of close to a shopping center that's existing or close to a train station or public transport, there's always the chance long-term if you've got one of these old little blocks that it may be sitting next to or be combined with someone else that picks you off. And then you get a really big capital uplift as well as a payday when you do exit down the line. So um, Mm. that's typically not going to happen in a residential street and it's not going to happen when you buy one of 50 apartments in a, in a complex. No. So um, there, there's, there's some also, there's some off ramps, you know, down the line that could be really um, financially viable for everyone as well. Yeah. The, um, and I certainly wouldn't buy a single unit, like I said, because I can't do too much. I'm controlled no. by strata. Yeah. Um, switching gears a little bit. Um, there is a special clause, Prue, that I now include in all of my offers because you and I had a conversation we and did. I have a template for my offers and always at the bottom I have this clause because it saves my clients and your clients about $1,500 or like a 1000 yeah. bucks um, to easily rent the property. Like can you, can you talk to that? <laughs> and it's so simple. It's words again. It's a bit like allowing a dog or a cat in a house. It's just words. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's all about time management. When you're about to buy a house, you want to have a tenant ready to go in uh, if that's your purpose. And so ultimately there will never be any um, – so it means as a property manager, if we set in a, a step in at settlement, we've got, then got to organise to have photos done. That takes a, t- you know, a few days and then we've got to do an open and then that takes a – you know, then do um, tenancy checks and then they'll move in a week or two later. So you've lost two or yep. three weeks in that process. So um, Joe is kind enough to always put in his <laughs> in his purchases and I have always done the same in the last 10 years as well, is that I want access for the purpose during settlement for the purpose of tenancy open inspections so I can find the tenant while I'm not paying the repayments and I also want access to those professional photographs because yeah, the professional that, that photographs is. would be beautiful and um, a lot of the time if you don't put that in your clauses and um, so the, the agent says, oh, that's okay, we'll sort that later. 
I've only found one agent in all this time I've been property manager, only for eight years, by the way. Um, remember, I was a DJ before that. So in, a, in actual fact, that particular period of time, it means that the, the, the um, selling agent usually won't let me in. They won't let me in. They won't give me the photos. And so then your purchaser is waiting three weeks for a tenant, whereas I want them to get those three weeks rent, which is, say, $500, so $1,500 they've just gained in their pocket because I'm ready to put a tenant in straight after settlement. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense, that one. Yeah. It yeah. does. The other one is not quite, so, not quite so good, but it's on the same path as if you're going to renovate it, make sure you have access for the purpose of getting your quotes. I mean, even better if you can start your reno. I've heard of people starting their reno. I was never lucky enough to do that, never been able to do that. But because um, a lot of times... How many solicitors will let you, let you do that? <laughs> yeah, insurance. Yeah, becomes, yeah insurance met. And yeah, just, um, it, there's so many reasons why you'll, that's, that's going to be a really hard one to get by. But I've seen that happen um, in deals that I've been involved with over the years, um, if it's a really old property where you can't really do any more damage mm. um, to it, then the owner's like, I don't care, go to town, do whatever you want. Yeah. I mean, basically, yeah. it's a basic knockdown. Um, I did when I just bought this development site, I got um, uh, approval to apply on the lot for subdivision. So within 24 hours or 48 hours of exchanging the contracts and going unconditional, uh, I had the council documents ready to lodge for the subdivision. The mm. owner had to sign that off as part of the deal. I had the subdivision and probably a one and a half million dollar uplift in value before I settled. Wow, that's great. Yeah. So it's that's so yeah, it's, that's that's manufacturing you know equity into a deal like that, and it's just yeah. about asking those little simple questions. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, hundred percent. One yeah. and a half million dollars in equity. Is that what you just said? Yeah. <laughs> that's exciting yeah. yeah it's a good deal that one yeah, I should, yeah. I'll take those, 10. I <laughs> yeah that's a good deal but i mean the point is not me point is that if you ask those little things and, and we're talking about the rental side of it that will make a massive difference to um just starting off on the right foot yeah, yeah exactly and as soon right as foot. you take keys on the friday instead of messing about it's tenants are straight in on the saturday ready to go it's just hand keys to them goes to them so so what, what's the clause you you just say allow me to have access for the purpose of rental as well as access to the photography the professional, the professional photos. photos yeah yeah absolutely because yeah, yeah. On one thing on that is what I was speaking to a client. They're like, no, don't worry about it. We don't want to complicate the, the contract. It's like, no, because if you, we'll just copy and paste. But we, uh, real estate makes it low res. Um, so when you try and download off real estate, it's all pixelated when you try and upload it to real estate. So it doesn't work. You need the high res photos. Yeah. And you want the marketing, all the marketing material. So, you, so it's not just the photos because you want the floor plan and you want the copywriting really as well because you might mince around the words mm -hmm. from the copywriting and copy and paste that into your own template or how you write it. But if you can yeah. get all of it, just you just want the marketing material. In it definitely hours. helps getting the floor plan. Yeah. 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 Great little tip there. All marking, all marketing material. I might change my, I might change it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want change a lot. The, you're going to do it. You might as well take the whole lot. And to be honest, an outgoing seller doesn't care. Um, no. were, it's a sunk cost for them. They already spent the money when they marketed the home. So yeah. it's just, it's you know, you might as well get the benefit of of um, of them spending that money earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. Okay. Well, anyone that's got any questions, start throwing some of the questions in the comments in. Um, Pru has been absolutely amazing with the time set and you as well, Scotty. Thank you both for um, covering no it. I've got um, I've got one question that we kind of, we, we only touched on really early and I'd love to understand more is about the, TAFE stuff, like in terms of mm. what what course is it? How do people get involved in doing it? How long is it? What, you know, what do you what do you teach? And is there other people that kind of you know um, add on other subjects around what you're doing? Um, I, I did a, a TAFE the, the full time TAFE course for Advanced Certificate and Property Agency. I think it was called back in 1995, which was all you could do other than a uh, land economics degree. Um, if you wanted to go more into valuation side of it. So, yeah, I, I mean, this is, I'm ancient, but I'm interested to see, um, you know, what is out there now for other people so they can learn at a low cost and learn at their own pace, whatever to, to you know, pick up these skills along the way. I'm going to break your heart. So what happened was TAFE <laughs> SA was running these for many years and then it wasn't the flavour of the month. People were not interested in property. Wow. They stopped being interested in property about 2018, 19. So um, the mistake. course stopped. 
Bummer. And imagine if it was still running now. There'd be people queuing for it. So yeah, that's where we're at. That. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, they did. Like property is just in our blood in Australia, isn't it? You've been of- running for 20 odd years, I think. It, I'd have to double check with Peter, but I was only involved since 2012. So it was about, you know, nine years, eight years, something like that. So it was, it was, it was a good, it was lovely to stand in front of people and help them. It was beautiful. Um, but no, it's not around now. So there's very little. Um, and, you know, I remember I mentored before I started property manager, I was mentoring people one on one. But that I stopped that too, because what I found was a lot of people procrastinate. They they come and they and it's lovely. Um, they think they, you know, that that I might be able to I can give them tips, but I can't I can't sign their checks and you know, like it's so it became one of those things. So mm-hmm. I found that property manager was a better path for me because I can hold their hand the whole way through and yeah. that's fun. I do enjoy that. I've and got the easy property manager adds so much value to the process. Well worth it. It does. Right. Whereas poor mm-hmm. old Andy, my husband, he's like the engine, so he's the one that's always dealing with the issues. So that's a bit, you know, I've got the good end of the stick with the business. It's great. <laughs> so so what are what are some of the questions we can ask as property investors to know if we have a good property manager? Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. I guess there's a few key questions if someone's looking for somebody and there's others that will happen if if you've already got one. Um, okay. You generally find that if you go to a property management only company, they're going to be focused on property management because that's all they do. If you yeah. go to one that's combined with sales, they'll usually their focus will be on the sales. So you're not, you're a bit forgotten part of the business at times. So um, someone's probably bidding at the screen right now, but that's the way I see it um, because no, if, it no. makes sense. The boss is going to be the in the property management bit, not in sales, so you're going to get some answers, uh, you know, keep up with everything. Um, so true. Each, each uh, a lot of the time, um, just meet the property manager. It sounds so simple, but meet your actual property manager. Um, before I did this, I was a business development manager for somebody else, which basically a different company, a big Um, franchise company and my job was to list and flick and I love that job but my job was once I've listed it I flick it back to property management and you've lost me Um, and so I you just got to be careful that you're not dealing with the BDM of the business you're dealing with the property manager you're going to be dealing with Um, Mm -hmm. there's others that are like a pod style that's frustrating so I've got a couple of property managers that now have gone pod style for us interstate remembering we can't manage these units in Mildura, good example. It's too yeah. far away. You know, I can't open do open yeah. inspections and things. So a pod style means that one person does one thing, one person does another, and so therefore you're dealing with five mm. people, say, and that's frustrating as a landlord because you don't know who you're supposed to talk to and left hand doesn't always talk to right. So it's nice if you just meet a property manager, deal with them, simple. You know, it's one person you just always talk to there over top of it. Um, obviously Google reviews. Uh, the other one and fees aren't always a reflection the fees are usually a reflection of the service you're going to get mm. so it, I know, have a different view on that personally but it is true I reckon to a certain degree but I have a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I also want to say that property managers are always in conflict and under so much pressure so if you get a good property manager you hold on to them because they're you know they are juggling so many balls Um, A lot of property managers, you want to make sure they're looking after less than 100 properties if you can. I was just about to talk about that because I've I've built three three rent rolls from scratch as well over time. And um, the number, yeah, the number used to be, I think, 150 or 180. This is going back a few years for me now. um, was the ideal properties to manage, the portfolio to manage. It's a good question, Joe, to ask how many are they managing, how many are they overseeing, and what's their longevity in that suite? Hundred well. percent per person. Yeah. Because you think yeah. about it, if they're looking after two hundred properties, how much you get? I think it's like fifteen minutes a week of their time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, but it's like it's, it's so a hard job got, and it's a thankless job for a lot of people. It is. It is. It is. I get good bit. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas, like, we manage one hundred and eighty, and there's three of us, so it's sixty per head. If that yeah. makes sense. So we're yeah. at a lot, much better ratio. To the fee thing, just really quickly, my, my point on it, because I don't want to just poo-poo all agents and say they're all overpaid and we should be negotiating them down. Um, <laughs> yeah, we do know a guy that can. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. But, but a big part of that for me is like um, people will say, oh, you get what you pay for, you know, you pay peanuts, you're going to get monkeys. That's all good, but that's kind of an old school way of thinking, I think, when you're looking at 
um, how to pay property professionals or even just professionals in general. We had a very, and we're not alone, but I'll just use my example. We had a very specific business plan of building market share incredibly quickly. And that meant offering low fees to bring people in. We paid our staff really well. We focused on the quality of the staff, longevity, managing that process and you know having a really good business, but we also did it at a really low cost. And we built 550, 600 managements in four years from a standing start, you know, averaging at about 1100 bucks a week. Um, so a really big rent roll can be built like that with low fees. It's got nothing to do with the level of service you're going to get. Um, so that you need to ask all the questions that we just discussed and then find someone who's also going to be competitive on fee. Because, you know, there's a, in Queensland, for example, and I know I've used Queensland a lot tonight and I'm not from here, I'm from Sydney anyway, but the, the difference in fees is just crazy. Like everyone puts a hand up for 7.7% in Queensland and in Sydney, our average fee, I think was 4.75% that we, when I ended up selling my last rent roll, it's the same level of service that goes into it. We were probably better systemized, better technology, and, you know, just right on the ball with getting the job done than a lot of the sleepy agents that are charging 7.7%. So you've mm -hmm. really got to shop around and ask questions because you might be able to, you know, save yourself quite a lot of money over the long, long hold of an investment property as well. Yeah. And also like there's a lot of, lot of property managers that like a lot of different, different states are at different prices. So there's people at 9%, there's people at 10%, there's people at 11%, there's people at 7%, but also 4.4%. And 7.7% on 1,011, like 1,100 income is more than 600 at 7%. So like it's like cash money, you're getting more, you're getting paid more at 4.4%, aren't you? Well, yeah, you have to, I don't do public maths, mate. Yeah, so. no, I was waiting for that. <laughs> it's nine o'clock at night. <laughs> I was waiting for someone to throw math at me so I could say that. <laughs> Just for you, Scotty. Um, that is a quote from uh, our little podcast that, that Scott was talking about this morning yeah. um, at, at the beginning of this session. Uh, cool. Okay. Um, but that's that's such a good that's such a good tip, though. Um, yeah. Is is because I had a, a great, amazing BDM as a for a property manager. I'm like, oh my gosh, this person's absolutely spectacular. And um, she, she came in. And she's like, look, you can put a wall here. And I was like, oh, perfect. I bought this as a two bed to put a wall in here. I'm glad you confirmed it. We can now do the, do this. Um, and but she's like, but if you take something, you've got to add something. And she's like, since you've taken this little entertaining area, you've got to put a you know a thing along here that then adds value to the kitchen, which then people can eat dinner there. And you gotta you gotta um, yeah, I guess it's having those conversations. But then I got put into the property management pool of just you know Stacy who doesn't care. Um, and every time I asked for a you know, are we at market rate rent? She's like, yep. Yeah. And I'm like, great. Can you raise them $30? Because I had a look and I'm not at market rate. So what's going on, Stacey? Um, so yeah. yeah, when you work with people that it's their business, it's just property management, I find a lot more uh, gets done from the property. Yeah. And generally speaking, if you think about it, if the, if the fees are lower, they've got, they're looking after more properties. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's a great question. How many properties do you, do you manage? Because what will happen is the agent will say, oh, we manage 1,500. It's like, wow, how many properties managers do you have? Oh, we've got, uh, we got four. Oh, wow. Well, that's yeah. a lot. <laughs> you no, know, I read an article they once where- They leave every two um, months because they're yeah. massively <laughs> that's overworked. It. Yeah. That's it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, apparently the average, I read an article once that said the average property manager lasts nine months. So if yeah. you're watching this wherever from and your property manager's turning over you really probably need to move somewhere else because be nice it'll be a, yep. yeah um it'll be something about um you know like nine months is all they last so you don't really want a newbie coming in all the time and new eyes yeah. if you can find someone that's a bit more stable you'll mm. find it's a bit easier for you let's question jump the box there do you want to address that one at the bottom i know let's jump into questions so um this one here also, another question regarding property management. Curious to understand how property management fees can vary on property type and location. Fantastic question. And anyone else that has any other questions, throw your questions in the little question box because we will answer that one. I can, I can have a go at that. I mean, if um, I don't understand exactly what they're saying in location, but I do know that if you have a student accommodation, like they, there's only about four or five 
companies in South Australia that do that and they charge about 15 to 20 percent on that because that's a lot harder um, I wonder also whether maybe because management fees in Adelaide the average is 8.8 so I wonder whether that is because um, up against someone like Sydney where the median rent might have been a thousand dollars a week you know as might have been 400 or 350 you know so maybe it's it's based around a bit of that as well um, so I think that might answer some of your question um, I hope that's answered question. the only thing I would have added I, I, I totally agree so it depends on the amount of work that's involved in managing the asset is going to determine where the fee sits yeah. so it depends if it's furnished if it's yeah student accommodation Airbnb whatever there's going to be varying degrees of, of scale there in terms of location I think the big thing that impacts that um, it's not necessarily going to be any more expensive in any, it shouldn't be any more expensive because it's in Adelaide versus Sydney for example other than just what market dynamics are but it's it's really competition in inner city Sydney where we were it's almost a race to the bottom on fees you know in certain other areas oh. if there's not so much competition then of course people are going to charge higher prices or try to charge higher prices so it really is just determining um, the level of competition and or supply in the market Mm. And one other thing yeah. that, to factor in as well is if the property is really far away from the city or really far away from anything, you're going to have massive property management fees. It's going to be like 14, 15, 20% because the property manager has to manage that and it's really quite far away. So um, that's another thing to throw under mm. that. Um, amazing. Okay, cool. We've got another question here uh, from you. Obviously, we can't give out any financial or any advice in any way speak to your qualified accountant broker and all other professionals but question when buying your 14 properties it's now 17 by the way well done uh what ownership structure did you find works best for you and are you buying in your own name or in a trust for example yeah good question so um i have no problem sharing that and remember i'm not an accountant either or anything. um so like everybody else i bought the first one in our joint names my husband and my joint names um because you don't know what you're doing well actually no you <laughs> If you just start out, you buy, I think the normal thing is we do what we understand first. So the first one was there, we bought a house close to home, exactly like most investors start, something close to home in their own name. So I was no different to that. Um, land tax in South Australia, I think, is the highest in the nation. So um, I recognise that was going to be a problem. So then I bought another one in just my name and then just Andy's name. And then we've got a trust. So we bought um, a couple in the trust. And back then, it was before the land tax changed, so you could have a portion, so you could create another name by saying, okay, it's 99% Muirhead Family Trust and 1% Pru. So that would create another entity. So I started doing that in a circle and then they changed all the rules. They said, okay, the government said, all right, there's no such thing as a minority on the value of a property when it comes to land tax. So they get lumped together. So therefore, um, we moved into a super fund. And we bought, um, we had very, very little money in a super fund. But I read a book about buying a house in a super fund. We had like less than $100,000, but we bought one anyway um, deliberately. And then that super fund's grown and grown and we've been able to buy another one in the super fund. But I have been going around in circles and answer you a question. And no, just that was the best, the best I, lap around yeah. it. Oh, yeah, cool. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, that's super interesting. And again, this ties in nicely with like the theme for you, I think, is like there is an opportunity there and there's a problem. Oh, I can't, oh, I can't borrow anymore because I've hit a land tax threshold. What do I do? Yeah. Oh, I go and speak to my accountant and I get the right advice that's specific for me and I make it happen. Oh, they, the yeah. government then changes the rules again. Okay, I'm going to figure out the answer to the problem and solve it. Yeah, can I, it's not can I, it's how can I. And, of course, land mm. tax is a state tax, is a state-based tax. So that's why we've got quite a few properties also over the border in Victoria too. Mm. So that, I, that, the thing that resonates for me out of this, Joey, that you're talking about is that, you, you know, you've powered along in this journey of life by opening your eyes and reading books, you know, and learning from other people and other experts and the rest of that's such a great thing for people to take away is you keep doing the same thing, you're going to get the same outcome, right? Like you've got to go and yeah. power up your knowledge and these different um, things because there's so much to learn. Just that one question about all the ownership structures, like that's so in-depth um, you, that you could go so many different ways with that. You could make a lot of mistakes 
things change on the run. Like you obviously worked out a system that worked really well, but then it changed on you. So you've got to change, you've got to evolve. You just direction. Yeah. yeah, like I work with mortgage brokers all the time. Um, in, in my role, I refer a lot of business to mortgage brokers. I've got a very good relationship with a broker that I use. They've been looking at the development site that I'm trying to fund at the moment for construction. And they've done a great job to the best of their ability on this, but it's not in their skill set. I managed to stumble across someone else in my path yesterday, for example, and said, oh, well, you're paying retail. The development stacks up for you to go wholesale. And that means a significantly different outcome here. Um, mm. and it's just those little things, isn't it? Like if you didn't kind of keep digging or, you know, mm. keep playing in the sandpit with the right people, then you're just not going to see these opportunities and you could end up paying 2% too much or not being able to borrow, borrow to buy the next property or end up in the wrong structure and pay too much tax. There's just so many yeah. different ways to get caught. And yeah, what I'm seeing here is that you've just been constantly open to new information and that's benefited you massively over your journey. Yeah, I mean, I guess a buy, renovate and hold and I never, ever sell because, of course, the equity it means that I can use the equity like cash in the bank and um, the it, it makes life so much easier. So if I was to sell it, I'd pay tax. Now, you would have heard me say before, I've just sold two, ta- two houses in the last year or two um, and that is because they were in the wrong entity. So because land tax yeah. all changed and our, our oh. circumstances changed, I had to let a couple of them go because they were in the wrong entity and it was just costing so we replaced them with something else, um, which was much better anyway. And and sometimes you just have to cut those off, don't you, in terms of you'll be better for it in five years or ten years' time, even though it might be a blip on the horizon right now. Um, So, yeah, there's different. you've just got to be wide open and getting great advice the whole way through. Yeah, Yeah, and that low-dot commercial loan, I'm pretty sure that was over 10% to get the Mildura units. Yeah. Yeah. But, but when you wash that out over 12 years or 14 years, you don't even remember it. Like it's a sunk cost to – It was your way one to year. Well, exactly. And I, all I knew was I had to – as soon as I got them on separate titles, that any lender will take me, well, within reason, hmm. probably second-tier lender because we didn't have an income or very much of an income. So ultimately the um, units were only for 12 months, so it wasn't going to hurt too much. Yeah, crazy. Well, Prue, thank you very much for covering all of this All of this for us. I think we've gone into an interesting world. I think that domain and real estate are going to have a lot more searches for blocks of units. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's plenty of them there. Just make sure you're not buying them at end value. Work out what they are at end value and you do not want to pay that. And you I like that little tip of possible. 70% you know, of the end value. I've not thought yeah, of it like that. That's a great be. little tip. To, to apply. It, you know, it's not advice again. It's sort of just a ballpark figure. Yep. Yeah. So how can people get learn more about you, Prue? How can they get in touch and, um, yeah, give us a bit of rundown on, on your head property management? Oh, thank you. Well, we're just a little business in Adelaide, um, the three of us, and, yeah, South Adelaide. Uh, so I am the driver of the business, so you meet me all the time. I deal with all the landlords. Andy deals with all the issues. Poor bugger. It's my husband. Um, you know, he's that's why I said it's it's a very challenging position for him and our sons like our wheels. He keeps us going. Um, we just I just love it. I really do. I started it because I was teaching at TAFE and people were frustrated with their property managers because, like they said, they last nine months and most of them um, there's a whole pile of property managers that are good. And like I said, if you can find somebody that is good, hold them with both hands because it's a tough gig. And the, I think the I think the wages are only supposed to be about 40000 a year for these people that are juggling up to 200 properties mm. when they've got the business owner at them coming this way and they've got the landlord this way, they've got the tenants not paying their rent. So you can imagine why they change jobs every nine months. It's tough. Yeah. So if you mm. find someone good, you hold on to them because they're worth their weight in gold. Yeah. Good but, yeah, I'm a property manager. I'm a property investor first and a property manager second. <laughs> yeah. Look at that. Inspirational we've got here. Oh, from Facebook thank you, user. Facebook user. That's lovely. <laughs> we'll find out. Dear Facebook user. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> we'll find out your name at the end. We'll find out. We always find out the names at the end of it. So we don't really know who it is at the time. Uh, <laughs> is there any question or anything that you wanted to cover off that we haven't already covered off? Are there any questions that you wish we asked um, to dive in? Any kind of other value ads you've got? <laughs> No, I think one of the things, I guess if I was doing it in today's market, which I think you wanted me to answer that, um, yes. I guess the, it's so much easier in today's market to find something positive geared because the interest rates are so low. Yeah. 
So, so to me, as much as the lending's a little bit harder, um, but there are ways to get around the lending. You know, joint ventures you can easily. The low dot loans are still around, but I think they need to be verified. Someone might kick me for that, but I think they they are still around. Um, but there's also these third tier lenders that people forget about. Like they want to stick mm. with the big four. They're scared of these names I've never heard of. And, you know, they might be the way to get yourself over the line. What What is wrong with paying the extra percent or two? If you have to, if the deal is there um, mm. and you'll know if it's there because there'll be some quirky property no one else is. Right now, if a property sits for a while, you're going to know you're in with a chance because yeah. in, in this market, especially in South Australia, things are still being snapped up. Um, mm. And like... Um, my friend Peter Kalizos always says the value's in the land, so try and buy um, something with land, not necessarily apartments. I've seen so many people lose money in apartments, which is a bit sad. Um, I don't know. There might be people, if, if there's a reason for you to buy an apartment because you're going to retire in it, that's different. Or yeah. um, I, my gut is that, you know, you're always better to have the land. That's why a unit is even better than an apartment because at least you've got a little plot of land but once again the whole block would be easier if you could buy something like that um i take something from margaret lomez in this one um if you're buying in a country town um i try and make sure that there's at least two reasons for that town to be existing um okay. and of course at least um say 25 30 000 people living there because you don't want to buy in some tiny little town because whoever's here from here, they might be looking up blocks of units and they're going to find this little towns. So you really do need to be aware of what you're, what you're buying and whether there is a rental market and those sorts of mm. things too. So, so if you can try and stick to the more regional, the larger regional towns would be great. Yeah, we don't have many of those in South Australia, but there's plenty of them in Victoria. I know that. Um, Cause I've done really well out of those little blocks of units and sure I've got, we, all the other houses, like we've got um, about eight different houses around the place too. So we're not just all blocks of units. We've got some houses as well and they've mm. been fantastic. So you can buy a house for dual reason. So, um, you know, you can get dual rent because interstate you can rent them separately. Perfect. I would certainly look at that. Um, in Adelaide, sadly, they're a little bit more behind than that and we can't do that. But sooner or later we should. But I guess I would probably... If I was doing it today, it'd be much easier to find positive geared properties. Um, and it will be the lending that yeah. probably holds them up. Um, and so, you know, if you can buy under market and um, get a, get an extra job for a period of time, uh, all that happened with me is I took this job. The um, lender actually rang my employer and said, is she actually working there? Because I only started two weeks before I put in this application for this loan. And I said, yes, yes, is her job stable? Yes, and I got the loan. <laughs> You know, so Easy as that. Think, yeah, Go I McDonald's. Think if, if you really want it, you can do it. Yeah. 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 Sage advice. Um, Scotty, anything that you wanted to uh, wanted to mention? Thank you very much, actually. Scott Agate from Hello House um, for being a sensational sponsor. Uh, what are you, a sponsor? Yes, you are a sensational sponsor. sponsor. Yeah. And even human. better when you pay us, um, yeah. which is the best <laughs> part. But also, as an amazing host, um, how did yeah, you do, people? Thanks. Throw it in the comments if he was sensational. <laughs> Thanks. The only thing I was going to say is there's, you know, in terms of uh, a lot of clients that I see that are looking for investment, there's positively geared and then there's positively geared. Like you can, you know, yeah. almost everywhere in Australia has seen capital growth. That is absolutely no guide to what's going to happen in the future. And just because a little town somewhere that's offering 7% or 8% saw 25% growth in the last 12 months, you need to be digging deeper than that. You need to be looking, what's it done over the last 10 years, 20 years? What's it going to do, more importantly, in the next 10 years or 20 years for the reasons that Prue just addressed just then? So I think be really careful about just buying for yield and just buying because it suits your price. Um, you know, really look at the fundamentals so you can, you can build a long-term portfolio that's going to continue to grow. Yeah. That is sage advice, Scotty Agate. Very, very well said. Amazing. Okay, guys, I think let's let's wrap this up. You rock, Scott. You've got some fans. Oh, We've got inspiration. And uh, cool. Thank you very much, Prue. Thank you very much, Scott. Let's uh, let's go buy a property. See you guys later. <laughs> See you <laughs> later. Thank you.